Hello to the global McIntyre and UVA community from Charlottesville, Virginia. Welcome to Managing Innovation, a course available to students here at McIntyre and from around grounds through the minor in entrepreneurship. Today we have a very special occasion we get to bring to you um, John Chambers, a renowned global CEO, um, a, a gentleman who is known as a legend in Silicon Valley. He'll be joined by Rebecca Weeks Watson, an alumna uh, from McIntyre in 2001, a digital media entrepreneur um, and uh, a terrific host for this um, facilitation of conversation out of John's home office in California. I'm Eric Martin, and I'm the director of the Glantz Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at University of Virginia. Let me give you a little brief background on John Chambers, um, very brief for a very storied career. John joined Cisco in 1991, a time when that company was of modest size, about 70 million in revenue, 400 employees, a single product. And over his career as CEO grew that company, Cisco, to a 46, uh, sorry, $47 billion um, leader in the technology space, one that became known as the backbone of the internet. If you go back through uh, Mr. Chambers' history and look at all the awards and accolades he's gotten, it's really impossible to do them justice in a short conversation here in class. Um, suffice it to say that he has been noted by CNN as one of the 25 most powerful people, has been distinguished by um, the country of India for service to that country. Um, has been noted as one of the 100 top performing CEOs in the world by Harvard Business Review. Of late, John has turned his attention to his passions for startups and the startup culture as CEO and founder of JC2 Ventures. Driving through his passion, through his innovative um, insight and his vision, he's mentoring companies and technology and food um, space in uh, government and everything in between to disrupt and drive transformation through economic opportunity that will change people's lives. Rebecca has interviewed John in the past through her company, um, The Reveal. It was both revealing and insightful. We're all very, very excited <laughs> to have John and um, to have, to have John and Rebecca joining us. Um, I'd like to welcome for all of us around the world, for those of us in the classroom here at McIntyre, our special guest speaker for the day, John Chambers. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you today, John. We appreciate your time and sharing your advice. There's so many different exciting topics that we're gonna to cover today. I first wanna start about uh, your personal leadership and style. Uh, okay. You are one of the most impressive CEOs um, in terms of track record um, in corporate America. And yet, when we were preparing for this session, you said, I don't want to start with my achievements. I want to start with my mistakes. Uh, so what are some of the biggest mistakes you've made as a business leader? And I think it's important for both the students in the class, but also for the alumni coming back in. Everybody writes about your successes. And we all like to talk about them a lot more. <clears throat> I sure do. But you're more a product of how you handle your setbacks. And many companies or many leaders, when they get setback, never come back. So it is how you handle your setbacks. And well, we had the most valuable company in the world at one point in time. We did 180 acquisitions. The textbooks are written about them. Uh, my biggest mistake was 2001. Uh, I was watching the market. We had had, if you could imagine, 40 straight quarters in excess of 60% growth. 85% uh, of our business was new every quarter, and yet we never missed a forecast ever. We were so good on our analytics, we knew given the order rate in the first day of the, uh, the month, the second day, the third day, compared to the same month, the same time period before, we could run our analytics and we could project exactly what we we're gonna do for the quarter and for the year. Uh, you never keep doing the right thing too long. Uh, in December of 2000, our order rates were 70% the first week of the uh, 
uh, of the uh, month, and we were on a tremendous roll. But the stock market was dropping like a rock, and would forecast 35% growth. And so to our financial community, we said, based on our analysis, and I cut my growth rate in half, I feel comfortable with over 30% growth this next year. Uh, long story short, we've never grown below 60% during uh, 40 quarters. Uh, by mid-January, we've gone from 70% growth to minus 30. Mathematically impossible. 25% of my customers disappeared. We were in free fall. It didn't help that all of our competitors did. And my lesson learned was very simple. Uh, you can't keep doing the same thing again and again and expect, expect the same expectations in terms of results. And I've made the mistake of not adding to analytics uh, the additional data feeds, if you will, from the stock market, et cetera, would sound basic today. Lesson learned for the group, however, fast forward to 2007, uh, the market was acting a little bit soft in terms of the stock market. Everybody thought the economy was okay. And eight out of my top financial uh, institutions in the U.S. growth rate in terms of orders slow. Our numbers were great for the quarter, but on my quarter report, I said there's something wrong in the financial markets, and I think it's serious. And of course, I got the tar beat out me <laughs> in the press and everything else. They say, well, this is a Cisco problem. I said, I don't think so. Uh, fast forward nine months later, we were in the greatest recession of our time. However, this time we saw it coming. We buttoned down the hatches on our company and we got really focused on cash flow. And we executed through that like none of our peers. And the automotive companies at that time were worried about going bankrupt and everything else. Nobody would sell to them unless you gave them cash. We extended credit. And so we took risks during the downturn, having seen this movie before, mm -hmm. and uh, emerged out of it not just stronger than everybody else. We never did any, even a bump along the way. So as you think about your futures, and it's easy to say, it's fun to talk with friends and family and business about your successes, but it's more how you handle those challenges to determine who you are in life. Yes. Um, and, you know, you have had so many wonderful mentors, mm -hmm. um, world-class business leaders, and then you've been a mentor to so many others. What do you think are some of the most important qualities of a leader? Well, the qualities of a leader are fairly similar regardless of what your, your position you're in. Uh, it is about outlining a vision and strategy for your unit, for your company, for your state, for your country. Uh, then it's about getting a leadership team together, motivating them, periodically changing them to implement that vision and strategy. It's then about staying close to your customers or to your citizens. It's also about surrounding yourself with mentors and critics and listen to the critics even when you disagree with them. Uh, but in the end, it's about results. And never get confused about, uh, did you do what you said you would do? You think about the currency of today, it doesn't matter if you're a country leader in the Middle East or mm -hmm. in Europe or here in the US or a business leader, uh, your currency is very simple. It's your track record, it's your relationships, and it's trust. And when you have that capability, you can move with speed, it's just amazing. Do you think that those qualities um, differ whether you're a leader of, you know, a small team, a few employees, or a big business or a big department? I don't think it, it differs at all. Whether it's your ability to get things done within your company or get your things done within the uh, uh, organization or the state you're in, or on a much larger basis, they're exactly the same thing. It's what is your track record? What have you done? Uh, do people see that? They will be aware of it. Then it's about the relationships and trust that you build and that allows you to move with speed. We can put together a funding of $145 million for a venture capital firm in two weeks just by making phone calls to the right enterprise companies, to the right VCs outlining a vision. And because of the track record and trust they had, we raised the money remarkably quickly. Mm -hmm. So you recently wrote and published this incredible book, which I think should be required reading within all the business schools, uh, Connecting the Dots, Lessons for Leadership in a Startup World. And um, one of my favorite parts was the book of the book was mm -hmm. the behind the scenes stories that you wrote about these really tough emotional situations um, within Cisco. Did you have a specific approach to those tough situations? Yes, I did. In fact, uh, I never intended to write a book. Uh, they could write that after you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody can say nice things about you, hopefully. 
Uh, but I wrote the book because it didn't matter if I was lecturing in Dubai or uh, in Paris in Polytechnic or Xinhua in China or MIT or University of Virginia or Stanford or West Virginia uh, or Duke. I apologize. I'm a Duke keeper. Don't hold that against me. I root for Virginia except when they play Duke or okay. when they play West Virginia. Thank you so much. Uh, but uh, it is the ability to get a replicatable playbook that allows you to move with speed. Uh, we could do 180 acquisitions, and I could get a call from the NASDAQ on a Thursday night saying, John, one of the companies you should own is going to be bought by one of your competitors tomorrow. It's now public knowledge, and you're an idiot because it's a perfect match for you. And I was so embarrassed, I didn't even know the name of the company, but I trusted the person telling me this. The next morning, I had my business development lead there. First thing, 8.30 in the morning, I called up the CEO at 10 o'clock at night, 9.30, my business developed lead, she said, John, come over. At noon, we had a handshake for a $3 billion acquisition wow. through both boards of directors through the weekend, announced Monday morning. My competitors never even knew we were there. Mm -hmm. It is that ability to run that place with tremendous success. It's what I do with country digitization and working with uh, President Macron in France. So he's really given given a opportunity for that nation to lead in entrepreneurship again. It was the last place you would do business just five mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it's the best in Europe. Their startups are up 5X. Or with uh, uh, a person like Prime Minister Modi in India, who is a very good friend I'll be with next week. Uh, it's about how do you digitize a country? How do you get that replicatable playbook on how, mm -hmm. here's what you do for startups, here's what you do for education, here's what you do for smart cities, here's what you do for GDP growth, et cetera. So that's one of the things that I hope to teach others how to do. And uh, uh, it's one of the things that I think each of you have to learn from your experiences on. My generation would have a couple jobs. I had three uh, during that, and I'm on my third now. Wow. Uh, but uh, my son's generation has already, John's uh, uh, already been in five different jobs. And I think the young people in the class today will probably be in 10 to 15. And you no longer teach people how to do an occupation. You teach them how to learn and how to change. Mm -hmm, that growth mindset. Exactly. It's yes. like knocking down the barriers that I know Eric and others are doing at University of Virginia to really look across the discipline, entrepreneurship mm -hmm. across the whole uh, the whole college. Mm -hmm. And in those tough situations where maybe saying, "Oh, you're an idiot," "You're not moving fast enough," or uh, or when um, Cisco stock was going down, dot com bust or whatnot, um, how did you stay calm under pressure? Well, my parents were both doctors, and I've got to give a lot of the credit to them. They trained me early on that when a patient would call up, and this was back in the early days, you got the phone call when a person went into labor. My dad delivered 6,000 babies, or mom was internal medicine and psychiatry. Uh, you get the phone call, and you, you watched how calm they were and how they focused. And they taught me early on how to do that. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it took me a while because I'm probably like many of the professors that you all work with in business school. I like to go, here's point one, here's point two, here's point three, point four. Uh, people don't remember those six months later. They'll mm -hmm. remember for the test, but they won't uh, later. So I've learned to tell stories that really drive home points. So staying calm under pressure, uh, I almost drowned when I was six years old. Uh, I love to fish, and my dad, in many ways, is my best friend. Uh, once I graduated from college and moved from a parent uh, child perspective to literally best friends. But at six years of age, we were fishing in very fast water. He warned me ahead of time don't get out in the stream because this is really dangerous and just stay on the edge of the bank. And even if you get a fish on you, you land it to the side. Well, you know, what did I do? I got out in the current and I got whipped out in the current. And uh, there was a flash that all of a sudden I realized this could be the end. And uh, my dad yelled at me from 100 yards upstream, hold on to the fishing pole, hold on to the fishing pole. I was getting helmeted down through the ramp. It's like New River for those of you that might have shot yeah, it. Right. And the ramp is there. And I've done that multiple times in the river there as well. But each time I would surface and I was getting bounced very hard, he was yelling at me to hold on the fishing pole. Well, he's worried about a fishing pole. It was right. not even back. Right. It was black <laughs> and yeah. etc. I held on to it. Care about this pole. So yeah. he was obviously worried about the fishing pole. Clearly, I was not in any danger. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I didn't think so because he was yelling at it, even though I was struggling to even breathe. And he got down uh, river about 150 yards, swam out, and pulled me in. And then he pulled me over to the side and he shared uh, 
with me, lessons in life, mentoring, if you will. Mm -hmm. And he said, during periods of tremendous stress and panic, most people think one move at a time. They go against the stream, mm -hmm. they panic, and that's where they die. And interestingly enough, a young 16-year-old athlete uh, uh, about 10 years later died in that exact spot. Wow. Nobody was there to remind him about holding on to the fishing pole. So dad taught me the lesson, and then he never told mom this, but when he took me at six years old, he said, are you ready? I said, yeah, he put me back in the current. Wow. <laughs> and he let me go whipping down to the rapids again and showed how you work over the side. It's a lesson that stuck with me for the life. And so usually the calmer I get, the worse it is. Mm -hmm. So when you see me bouncing off the walls like now, that's my normal <laughs> mode. If I ever really slow down, very focused, it means we got a tough challenge coming. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is being calm under periods of leadership. But you know, what you're leading me to is also uh, crisis management. Mm -hmm. Very few companies handle it well. And there have been several examples out here in Silicon Valley where the tech companies could not have handled it worse. Mm -hmm. 101 in crisis management, you know where I'm going, Rebecca, mm -hmm. is uh, be visible as a leader. Uh, Rule number two is determine how much was self-inflicted and how much was external. Rule number three is paint the picture for everyone, what you did right, what you did wrong, and what you're going to look like one and three years out. Mm -hmm. Rule number four is say, here's how you manage my progress. And rule number five, you go to each of your constituencies, your employees, your shareholders, your customers, the media, and give them regular updates. As basic as that sounds, no one does it. What are they doing to get in the crisis? They right, make it one hole. move at a time, they dive in the hole, yeah. they make one move and say, well, how was that interview? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, who cares about the interview? I'm asking, did you paint a picture? Are you gonna get out there? Are you gonna turn around this? If you move fast, you can get out of it fairly quickly. If you make the mistake of having second day and third day stories, mm -hmm. it'll take these tech companies probably five to 10 years to come out of them, the wow. position they put them in. And, and Facebook, and I like the people there a lot, but they could not have handled it worse. Oh. Um, so let's switch to um, the topic of innovation. Okay. One of your biggest priorities at Cisco was um, leading for innovation through the long term, right? Yes. But as a public company, you were also um, held to responsibilities for quarterly results. So yeah. how did you balance those two time frames? Well, I think it's one of the hardest things that uh, business leaders, and I'm talking about leaders throughout the whole company, not just the CEO or the CFO do today, is there has to be a balance between the short term and the long term. Uh, interestingly enough, when I did Cisco, I didn't focus on the short term at all. I focused entirely on the long term. If I could get my competitors focused on this month, this quarter, I had them. Mm -hmm. And uh, today's markets are much less patient. Shareholder activism, I think, is a real problem. Uh, while there's an occasional problem they're correcting, the majority of the time they just do more harm than good. And you get leaders thinking way too short term. I don't know about the students in this classroom, but most of the students when I lecture in France or uh, India or uh, out here at Stanford or up at MIT, uh, they're going into startups. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is not the interest in going to the traditional large companies or the government uh, that there was before. Mm -hmm. The Wall Street firms mm -hmm. are struggling to get the talent they were just a decade ago. And this is causing companies to interface with startups in a different way. They're looking to the startups to partner for innovation and to do things differently. So one of the courses that Eric might, uh, might think about isn't just how do you do acquisitions uh, in a marketplace where most of them fail, but also how do you interface if you're in a large company to a small company effectively. Mm. And if you're a small company, how do you interface to a large company where they either don't kill you with too much love yeah. or kill you through neglect? Mm. And when most people think about uh, companies failing, they think about swinging huge and, and missing and failing. Um, but you believe actually that companies die because um, they do the right thing for too long. So Absolutely. what does that mean? Well, it's like I did all my numbers. You know, I was so good at the numbers and my CFO and I were so joined at the hip uh, that we got into a rut with it being very predictable. And when there was a different variable put into the equation, it surprised us, it shouldn't have, but it did. And uh, in our industry, and this is the important thing about watching transitions. I come out of Charleston, West Virginia, I'm very proud of my home state, 
But when I, I graduated, we were the chemical center of the world, 6,000 top engineers, right in Charleston, coal mining center of the world, 125,000 well-paid miners, uh, more millionaires than the UK had. And yet in three decades, we became number 48 or 49 or 50 in almost all measurements. Uh, there is no entitlement in this world. If you don't change, if you don't reinvent yourself, you get left behind. You can say, well, John, that, that was just a natural occurrence. It wasn't at all. Boston 128, MIT, great venture capitalists, et cetera. I was with Lang Laboratories there. Uh, we were the Silicon Valley of the world. We thought these crazy people out and, and, and uh, a unique location <laughs> with unique personalities didn't get it. And boy, we were wrong. We got displaced in a decade. And, 32,000 people at Wang lost their job, 104 mm -hmm. at Digital Book lost their job, a million jobs disappeared because the region and the companies didn't reinvent themselves. So keep doing the right thing for too long will get you in more trouble uh, than ever. And you can always do the examples of bookstores versus Amazon or mm -hmm. even a great company like Walmart. I was on their board. We saw Amazon coming and yet we could not move creatively enough to get ahead of them in terms of the transition where technology combines with business models. That's one of the things that I think for those of you in business school, it's no longer an option regardless of your career plans, whether you're in med school or a lawyer or uh, public service or in business or engineering, you've got to understand entrepreneurship. You've got to understand these changes. And so teaching people how to knock down the disciplines and how to really think outcomes much, much more, I think will be a way of the future. When you combine that with technology, these changes, instead of occurring over several decades, will occur in two to three years. Mm. With my startups, and we'll challenge some of the giants, just like we did at Cisco, uh, we literally, all we need is a one-year lead, and even a very good tens of billion dollar company will never catch us. Mm. And so it is about speed combined with taking risks and getting outside your comfort zone. Everybody in this room, you're real comfortable, Rebecca, when change happens to you and I right. sit there giving you advice, right. et cetera. Yeah. When it happens to me, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be willing to get outside that comfort zone. For those students and those listening in, if you agree with everything I say today, I will fail. I want to make you uncomfortable. I want to say if the university doesn't reinvent itself every three to five years, if the professors in the business school don't change their curriculum and integrate it deeper with technology and understand technology and especially around AI and Internet of Things uh, and 5G will change business models at a speed we've never seen before, uh, you'll get left behind. Mm. And there is no entitlement to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley doesn't reinvent itself and the jury's yes. still out. We'll get left behind. Uh, so it's about really operating in an era when it's disrupt or you can get disrupted. Mm -hmm. One of the other great themes of the book is um, is your experience seeing that the best outcomes come from this relentless focus on the customer yes. and the customer's needs. So walk us through how you sort of implemented that throughout and it created a culture of that. Well, many people, their businesses, think they have great customer service. Let's use the airlines as an example for any of you that have flown like 85% uh, of the CEOs think they have very good customer service, and yet less than 10% of the consumers think that they do. And I've always believed that in business to business, you can listen to the customers or listen to the consumers or listen, if you're a political leader, to the citizens, and you can see the trends. And so I always drove off of uh, my acquisitions uh, the strategy of who do the customers are you want me to do? I get an idea, but then I go to the customers and say, what do you think of this company? Uh, and I wouldn't buy it. And I was behind every, unless they gave me the thumbs up on it, behind every one of the 180 acquisitions, I could tell you the two or three customers that really push me to do it or not. Also, your customers will tell you when you're making mistakes if you're willing to listen. We talked about currency. There's not a customer that I'm aware of that I can't go back and interface to today with tremendous trust. Because my track record and the team behind it, we did everything possible to always deliver on what we would say. And then when you're taking risks, if mistakes happen, then you do your best you can to correct them. You not only have the track record, you build relationships. And with that track record and relationships, you can move with speed and trust. I do all my deals on a handshake, even the multi-million dollar, billion dollar deals. And I did 10 of them over a billion, 12 of them over a billion dollars on a handshake. Mm -hmm. Lawyers are driving crazy, but I said, <laughs> here's the agreement. Right. Here's what I want you to do to make it happen. Mm -hmm. 
and similar to how coaches and athletes develop these um, playbooks for certain situations, you loved being able to develop and, and replicate these playbooks at Cisco. So yes. describe some of those um, playbooks that you used and what were some of the outcomes? Well, we'll start with one that we alluded to earlier, the playbook for acquisitions. When I first started to do an acquisition in the early 90s, I knew the majority of them would fail. And that's why nobody did them in high tech. It's different in the bank in, banking industry when nations bought a Bank of America. They were buying customer sets and geography, not people. In high tech, when you buy a company, you're buying the people and the next generation product. So knowing that well in excess of 90% of them failed at that point in time, and today that hasn't changed dramatically. If you're going to do it differently and think you're just going to be smarter, you're going to be wrong. So we studied why did they fail, and we said, what are we going to do differently? Uh, we were always customer driven in which acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Did the customers really think it was important? Did they think of it balanced within it? We never acquired a company with a different culture. And you can say, well, why is culture important? Well, if your culture is different than the company you acquired, you're not going to be able to keep the people. And you're going to pay a tremendous premium for both almost every person in the company that really says, if you don't get the next generation product out, you made a bad mistake. Mm -hmm. So culture is a huge element. Then you've got to agree upon what do both sides want out of the acquisition and make sure that you deliver on the ingredients of that to your target of the acquisition you bought. Because at Cisco, all I had to do was reach out and say, you know, we're interested in acquiring, and they would rather go with us at dramatically lower price than with our competitors at a higher price. So you develop that replicatable playbook. The same thing on country digitization. It sounds as complex, but with Macron in France, we outlined GDP growth of an extra one to three points per year. Uh, here's the job creation we can do in an area that was having family, unfortunately, unemployment above 10%. Uh, here's how you change the curriculum in the schools. Here's how you make it inclusive beyond just Station F and Paris and beyond. How do you drive it through in terms of your top priorities? Uh, here's what you're going to have to do in terms of venture capital. Here's what you're going to have to do in terms of role models. These are the change of regulation government's going to have to make, et cetera. Ran the exact same playbook with Prime Minister Modi in India, a different sequence, digitization of the country first, GDP growth second. Uh, digital make in India third, uh, startups fourth, they have to create 1.2 million new jobs per month. So it requires a skill that, that uh, uh, almost is hard for us to grasp here sure. in the U.S. But it was that replicatable playbook and he got it. He's one of the most amazing leaders I've ever met in my life and I've met them all mm. around the world. Mm. So speaking of startups, um, you found an investment company called JC Square Ventures. Explain why you chose the portfolio companies that you've invested in thus far, and are there any specific technology areas that you're focused on? Uh, in the sequence, you raised the questions. Uh, first is, I have three basic views of life. You know, I would really want to make a difference. Uh, I uh, really want to live life to its fullest. I want to give back. And I think they actually go hand in hand. Uh, and so it's family first in terms of my attitude, uh, and that's true within the company. It's, it's our employees first in terms of how you go. But what I tried to do uh, on the startups, it's, it's not fair, but I can, but I can pick up anyone in the world I want. Sure. And they give me unbelievably good terms uh, for each of them. So it's more of which ones do you pick uh, that you want to invest in. And I'm more of a mentor, a strategic partner than I am a traditional VC and coach along with my son and, and uh, uh, Yvette and uh, Shannon and the rest of the team. And so we are a coach to them. And so the first thing I look at, is there a company that's in the business disruption occurring at the same time technology enabled? Uh, and much like Amazon did you know, 20 years ago, uh, they were using technology to completely disrupt uh, retail and did an amazingly good job of it. And unfortunately a lot of job destruction in the process. Uh, so I watch for that. What is the vision of the company? Is there a market transition and a technology transition at the same time? Mm -hmm. The second thing I look at is the CEO and the founding team. And this is one that if the CEO, if she or he doesn't really want to be coached, if they aren't wicked smart, I don't touch it. Third thing I do is there's only one Steve Jobs. 
He just knew what to build. It still took him seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to do it differently. I go straight to the customers and say, all right, what do you think of this company? Uh, what do you think the uh, opportunities are? Where does it fit strategically within your agenda, et cetera? Mm -hmm. and now I try to pick a company that's very close to an inflection point. So my every startup is uh, currently growing in the security field over 200% year over year. Uh, the average one, I do everything from social media to solving world hunger with crickets mm -hmm. as the next form of protein. Uh, we focus uh, a great deal on the Internet of Things and the mm -hmm. transitions that are occurring there. A lot around artificial intelligence where if you and if I were a student today, uh, I would measure an entrepreneur, or a major, a major, uh, have my major in uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, a little bit of the knowledge on security. Mm -hmm. And that would make you very marketable the rest of your life because yes. those are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. So I pick and choose. We're in 18 of them today. We run a replicatable playbook in terms of how we both select them, how we interface to them, how we manage. I even take uh, a dozen of them a year up to Alaska fishing with me, bring 10 seasoned executives. We go out in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, the grizzly bears are truly the wild ones, not you see in the state parks, et cetera. And when you're with the team for a week, you really get to know them, you learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing like 20 to 100 startups a month. Just an amazing amount of, of startups and entrepreneurs. And then you're also advising France and India. So compare um, and, and contrast, you know, the US based startups that you're seeing to the ones in the global landscape. Well, the US still leads, but it's way too pocketed. Uh, probably. It used to be almost 90% of our venture capital went right into Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, uh, the largest percentage in the world went to the U.S., probably in excess of 80%. Today, we're not even 50% good news of venture capital that goes into the U.S. Uh, the good news is it's getting spread wider. You, you see some very good activity in New York, down in Texas, uh, at the University of Texas. You see it in Silicon Valley. OA is starting to take off a little bit, and there are other pockets. Uh, but it's not near as broad as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all job creation will come from startups. The large companies, wow. as you know them today, will do uh, will not add incremental headcount over the next decade and probably never again. Uh, between artificial intelligence and the huge focus, uh, literally, on productivity, uh, you're going to see uh, those companies actually shrink and maybe shrink dramatically. And this is talking to the CEOs. This isn't theory or, mm -hmm. or anticipation. So it says if you really are thinking about your future, you're probably going to be working for a small company in the wow. future. Uh, and that how good that is in Virginia or in a California mm -hmm. or my home state of West Virginia will determine is your economy any good or not. Mm -hmm. And so it's thinking about how do you create the right environment for startups. Our startups are we're at an almost 20 year low just three years ago in the US. And while you hear about all the unicorns, et cetera, the number of initial public offerings, IPOs, which are a very good indication of the health of your economy, are at half the number they were during the 90s, during the internet boom. So we have not got enough in the pipeline for our country to do well in the future. You're going to have to create 25 million jobs in the next decade. Uh, you're probably going to destroy 10, 12 million jobs through uh, AI and through automation. So you need a total you know, scenario of let's say 35 to 37 million jobs. Mm -hmm. There's not enough of the pipeline to do that. And even if there were, and it was just in New York and West Coast and a little bit in certain cities in the South, what happens to the heartland of America? See Pace's comment, the Rust Belt, if you will. Right. And so I think as a nation, we need to make this our top priorities. We've got to really start thinking about how we change the curriculum, how we change the inclusiveness of this, not just by uh, geography, but by gender, by age as well. Mm. You know, John, I'd love to open it up to questions from students in sure. Eric's class. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, um, uh, John and Rebecca. Uh, the first question we have is from Sarah Khan. Sarah? Hi, Mr. Chambers. Um, so Hi, uh, please call me John. You can call me I missed her in another 20 years when I'm really old. <laughs> okay, so um, my question is, what signals did you see while at Cisco that told you the company was making the required progress in innovating? And how did you know when the company was not successfully innovating or innovating enough? 
Yes. Well, first of all, I believe as the CEO, but it's true of any leadership position, you always want to trust but verify uh, that any time I left somebody in a job for longer than four years, I ended up actually regretting it. I've, I've learned most people won't reinvent themselves, so moving people around. Signals I would watch in terms of innovation is what do our customers say? How did they view that? I always focus on competitors in terms of keeping score. It's like University of Virginia uh, playing North Carolina, and we're all in agreement. I want you to beat them again this year. When you play Duke, we might have a little bit different discussion. <laughs> But the scorecards, your market share, are very indicative of what you're doing. I follow, followed every critical account in the world every night myself, 365 days a year. So I would listen basically to the problems where the technology was not getting the desired outcome, and I could see the problems occurring. I built that into the culture. So there were a number of five or six different touch points that I would use to see where we are, what was occurring, I still got surprised periodically, but it is developing what those are and listening mm -hmm. to your employees, your employees, your family, and it was a family at Cisco. I knew every illness of every employee, their spouse, their children, and we would move heaven and earth, didn't care what the insurance said, to take care of them. Uh, and so it was a very close family. Our attrition rate ran 5% in an industry that runs 15. Our attrition rate, our acquired companies ran 4%. So I've watched attrition rates. I've watched it by unit, by geography. I've watched customer satisfaction. I've watched critical accounts. Got it. Do we have another one, Eric? Yes, thank you. Brian McKernan. Hi, John. Um, my question is, I read an article over the summer that said one of the CEO's hardest jobs is learning how to lead or manage people smarter than themselves. Um, did you experience this during your time at Cisco? And if so, what strategies did you employ to effectively lead and manage these people? Yes. Well, first of all, and it isn't the way you ideally would like it, but there's no substitute for just raw talent. It's like a sports team where Canley, it's raw talent in terms of intelligence, both IQ and EQ. My dad early on uh, taught me how to both compete and lead uh, uh, people who were very smart and very good we played duplicate bid bridge in Charleston, West Virginia, 6,000 engineers who were many of them potentially uh, smarter than us. But I learned that the engineers were remarkably predictable and dad and I were not. Oh. And so we would beat them most all the time because you knew what they were going to do. So to me in life, the way you manage people is you create an environment that they're motivated by. You outline a vision that gets them excited. Uh, you provide feedback and treat them like you'd like to be treated yourself. And they want to work for our goal than just financial success. You want them to be financially successful. We created 10,000 millionaires at Cisco out of our employee base, but we also changed the world when every corporate social responsibility award there was from Democrats and Republicans. And so what I do is try to much like your University of Virginia basketball coach does, how do you build a great team with a lot of talent that plays very well as a team and how do you get them playing as a team? To tell you a worse story, I was at the Duke-Stanford game uh, out here in the West Coast when they were one or two, and uh, this has been over a decade ago, and Coach Zeski, who was out of IU, Bobby Knight, uh, I was in MBA school with uh, Coach Zeski and got to know him pretty well, and he had me to dinner that evening with his team, and he had me at one table, and he asked me to talk to the number six guy who was going to start in place of the number five the next day, and I watched this all occur. Uh, the night before they were playing to see he was one and two uh, at that point in the season. And during the evening, the team talked about how much they loved each other and how much they cared for each other and gave each other hugs. And I'm sitting back going, perhaps they aren't quite tough enough this year. And <laughs> Coach Kay yeah. asked me for after that and uh, what I thought, and I said, I think you got a great team. I, I did my job on the number six guy. I understand mm -hmm. why he's got to start at number five and it read than his roommate in that role. But I said, Coach, I'm not sure they're quite tough enough. And that was the most physical team Duke ever had. A guy by the name of Boozer was in the center. Uh, they were unbelievable. And I learned how important it is to pull a team together. And it, it doesn't work for everybody, but I love the people that I build the team around. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, when you take on my teams, you take all of us on. Mm -hmm. uh, it is unconditional caring. And the willingness to say that and build a culture of that and take care of people like a family uh, was tremendously uh, powerful. So you learn all the time and what's important. That's not a culture of Oracle mm -hmm. uh, or of a Microsoft, but it was at Cisco and it is with my startups. Mm -hmm. What I didn't realize as a leader is everybody gets its vision and strategy. Everybody gets this great team. Everybody understands that you have to communicate. Culture is as important as strategy. And you build a culture. You never have a great company without a very strong culture. You may like the culture, you may not, but a culture is a huge part of a company's success or leader's success. Mm -hmm. One of the things that keeps coming back to, um, and this is important not only for the students um, that are listening in, but also the alumni, is not doing the right thing for too long in your career. Like you said, if, it, if you're in the same position, you're doing predictable things for a couple of years. Um, you know, how can people listening in really disrupt themselves in their careers to stay ahead? Well, the first thing is you probably don't want to stay in the same position for four or five years. You want to take a lateral position or a promotion up uh, in the process. You've got to get outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and change, as we teased earlier, Rebecca, is great when it happens to others, not when it happens to me and you. Uh, and you've got to realize if you don't change, you're going to get left behind. So it's having the curiosity. When I've met great leaders, there's a common characteristic among them. Uh, one of them is they're naturally curious. I mean, they really like to be wide read. You can be a President Clinton fan or not, even though I'm a moderate Republican, socially liberal uh, in, in that term. Uh, he was probably the smartest political leader I've ever seen. And, and his ability really to anticipate where things are going and to be outside his comfort zone, he did with great uh, ease. Uh, I was also uh, a, a huge fan of Macron, who was very comfortable changing a culture and really making a difference and putting it all on the line to be able to make that happen. So I would say as a leader, be comfortable taking risk. And when you're comfortable in your job, it's time to change. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true of a basketball coach, a professor, leader of a state or leader of a country. Got it. And one last question we had from um, the alumni group of people who wanted to ask you some questions is, um, you know, you've had Jack Welch and some amazing world-class leaders. Um, as your mentors uh, along those decades. And um, what would you say is sort of the best piece of advice you got from them? <laughs> well, from Jack Welch, the best piece of advice was uh, you never have a great company until you have a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was at the time we were about to become the most valuable company in the world. I was honored to win every CEO award imaginable. Tried to stay reasonably humble on that because I, 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 when you win, it's really the team that got you there. And I know there's always a downside on the other side of it, but he said, John, you want to have a great company and do you have a near-death experience? And I said, I kind of get that. I really didn't. Uh, in 2001, it was the worst year imaginable. I literally was out here on the porch mm -hmm. wishing, wishing that I didn't have to leave this company sure. through the changes that were about to occur to do layoffs and everything mm -hmm. else. And uh, it was very hard on me emotionally and physically, but it was the job of the leader. Uh, and as a leader, you've got to be like a rock. People can't see you shake uh, on it. But at the end of 2001, Jack Welch called me up and he said, John, you now have a great company. I said, Jack, it doesn't feel like it. My shareholders have doubts. Should I even be the CEO? Some of my strongest supporters inside the company have doubts, et cetera. And he said, you've got it. You made the changes. You'll come out of this stronger. I watch your peers, they're collapsing and this will be your best leadership year ever. And I say, Jack, you're probably the only leader that will say that to me, and he was. Mm. Uh, but it goes back to the issue of how you handle that advice and balance. One that might surprise you, uh, one of the senior lawyers at one of the top law firms of the state, we walking down through the halls, uh, asking for his best piece of advice, and something I encourage all of you to do, both students and people uh, in the business world, is, Rebecca, what advice would you give me? And I asked that of the senior leader, and he looked at me and he said, John, always take time to go to the bathroom. It'll become more important to you <laughs> later. I chuckled a little bit, and I was trying to figure out what was he telling me. We walked down the hall about another 30, 40 feet, and he said, did you get what I just said? I said, yeah, I did. When you come out of a meeting, summarize everything in that meeting, your action items, get them assigned in your head and otherwise. 
before you go to the next meeting, take all the time to get the stress off your mind, to get relaxed to the next meeting, plan how you're going to start it, and start the meeting crisp and online. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's probably the best practical, practical experience I've ever get. Most people do not do that, but that's very useful. Well, and I also found that in your book, a large mm -hmm. portion of it was about the preparation needed for every single meeting, whether you're yeah. meeting with, um, you know, the leader of a country or um, someone more junior than you, you're doing this intense amount of preparation to understand what, what are some of the synergies you could have in that meeting. Well, uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I'm usually the best prepared in every meeting I go into. That doesn't mean you do three meetings a day. Mm -hmm. I do 10 to 15. Uh, and uh, uh, but as you get a routine down where you can get prepared, people know what you want to see, even with a relatively small team behind you, you go into every meeting able to anticipate the future of, of what they're going to do. I did the same thing with our competitors. I studied them uh, very much, not looking to how they did strategy, you compete on market transitions, but I studied them as the personality and what motivated the CEO. And you could predict what a Vincent Fay would do at Huawei uh, based on his history of his mm -hmm. parents being in concentration camps because they were educators and how put them in concentration camps because of that and him spending 20 years to clear their name, the fact that he was in the Red Army and what did that really mean on the implications, uh, what was important to him. And so when you really understand your competitor, much like the bridge players we talked about before, you can predict what they're going to do and you can predict how they will react to your overall approach. Well, this has been so much fun. We want to thank you for all the valuable insights and stories that you've shared and I recommend everybody Get a copy of John's book, and thank you. We'll turn it over to you, Eric. Rebecca, it's a pleasure. Eric, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you to the community of UVA supporters around the world. Um, we all are very, very pleased to have you in our classroom. We hope you'll come back again soon. Everybody, John Chambers. Thank you all very much.